All right, guys, we're back. A day in Miami podcast, and today we have a very special guest, very interesting guest. Uh, you guys have probably seen it all over the place. Uh, don't know much about it, but here you're going to learn a little bit deeper of what is and who plays for Highlight. We got Scott today, Scott Savin. He's the operator of the World Highlight League here in Miami, Florida. And we got L.A. Les Bradley. He's actually one of our players for the Lifestyle Miami Chargers. I think first things first, Scott. Uh, first, welcome. Thank you guys for, for coming through today. Thank you. Uh, I know you guys on a relatively personal level. Yes, uh, very deep. I know uh, what Highlight means to, to you and to you. Uh, and uh, to me, it's a very impressive uh, what's been going on with the sport itself and the way it's grown over over the years. I was telling you guys earlier that when I was young, going in the city, I would see these billboards that say highlight, highlight, highlight. I would hear on the radio. My parents, you know, they were immigrants coming from Cuba. It wasn't really something. I, they never took me over there. So when I had the opportunity to come now, I've been going to highlight for two years now almost. And it's uh, it's a thrilling adventure. And it's, it's impressive to see what you guys have done. Appreciate it. So I guess to start, Scott. Yep. Um, what got you into this situation to bring back Highlight to the city of Miami the way that you did? Long story. Um, we'll try and shorten it a little bit. Most people remember Highlight as the place where they made their first bet and drank their first beer because they would let you in usually two years before you legally could drink or bet with a fake okay. ID. <laughs> and that's like, that's my first exposure to Highlight. And that's pretty much everybody I meet tells me a similar story. But um, such a great sport, fastest ball sport in the world. Um, in many ways, to me, it's sort of like bullfighting or something where the athletes are far, far better than people give them credit for being. I mean, they're out there with a ball traveling 150 miles an hour, no padding other than a helmet. You know, and that you don't find that in sports. So it's almost some romanticism to the sport. Really, really difficult sport to play. Um, I got involved at this level back about probably 10 years ago at this point when we were running Dania Hailai. Okay. And I was exposed to the players there. I was talking to the players and we were negotiating contracts and they they wanted a lot of money and they had a lot of demands. And I'm like, well, why do I even need to sign contracts with you guys? I could go find some good athletes and teach them to play Hailai. I don't really need you guys who've been playing for, at that point, 20 years or so. And they're like, no, nah, you can't do that. You know, Most of them were... Um, from the Basque region of Spain, which is a very close circle over there, like close tight circle. That's where the that's where other than Joey, the one American who like is pretty much is the best highlight player of all time. All the rest of the greats are from that Basque region of Spain, and they're like, you just can't teach American kids like how to play highlight. It'll Tell take Scott you can't do something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know <laughs> this is a testament to that. It wasn't it, well. I was offended by it, but. I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure that we could get some athletes. And I was thinking at the time of, you know, UM grads um, who maybe never played highlight before and we'll teach them how to play. And they're like, you just can't do it. It'll take five years before they can throw and catch with proficiency. They'll never be as good as, as any of us. And uh, I mean, LA sitting here, he's, he's living proof that you take a good athlete um, with good coaches, teachers, and they can become great highlight players. Yeah, that's impressive. I mean, I obviously seen you guys live. Um, I don't trying to give them a run for the money, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand how people think it's an easy sport. You know, you need to have extreme cardio. Yeah, you know, your arm strength has to be. I know, even though you move with momentum, you know, you have to have uh, a lot of um, endurance, and yeah. your body needs to be. I assume you need to be very flexible. Yeah, you know, to yeah. be able to move around. Although there are some players that, you know, they're a little more heavy on the heavy side, but they have a rocket of an arm, you know, so you see people from all walks of life. How did you begin getting into highlight? So it all started, uh, I guess, when I went to UM, I ran track there, and then uh, once I graduated, finished uh, running and competing, um, I ended up getting a letter from the UM athletics department, and they were saying, you know, hey, there's this new quote unquote new sport that, um, you know, which was that letter was was yeah it was from, by Scott yeah, you know, exactly Scott yeah. sent that out to you guys that <laughs> so was a brilliant was, move by him <laughs> so it was um it was a uh, it was interesting I was like you know let me check it out see what it's about I've always been you know an athlete competitor at heart so I was like let me check it out and then you know I showed up for the um uh the trials essentially and then uh, with uh, one of my teammates Ben and uh, we tried out together and then it was kind of just going since then you know. But when you first got that that letter, what kind of like sparked your mind? It was just curiosity, like, hey, you know, just gonna go try this new sport. Yeah, just pure curiosity. I've always been someone to try, you know, try things new and you know, see what happens, see where it goes, and 
kind of kind of roll with it. And how long into your you know practicing and getting a gist of it did you know like okay I think I can really you know turn into a, a good professional athlete playing this sport. You know, seven years later, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But um, you know, I was I was. I don't know at what point, but I was just like, I'm just going to give it my all every single day, you know, that I'm there and trying to trying to improve. I feel like with any sport, no matter how good you get, there's always like some little like very small nuance like thing that you can like you need to figure out. And as soon as you figure that out, it's like there's something else. It's like a whole nother level, like the rabbit hole keeps on going deeper and deeper. So I see a lot of these guys have been playing for 15, 20 years. And I'm just like, man, how do they get so much spin on the ball? And it's just like it's not something that's like taught or you can inherently figure out it's just like trial and error and like paying so much close attention to like the small movements in your hand or feeling the ball depending on how if it's in the, in the back of your cesta or, or in the front and then like it, it's just like it just, i can just <laughs> it goes very deep but it's it takes a lot but these athletes eddie i don't think they get the credit honestly they deserve the bass players the spanish players just they they grow up playing it like american kids are throwing a football in the backyard or shooting you know shooting baskets and it's like we said to them, okay, we're going to make you professional highlight players. That would be like, you know, me coming to you. Maybe you're a golfer. I said, okay, all right. But, and you're going to be a professional golfer in six months. And there's no way you're going to be shooting par or under par in six months, right? Maybe not even six years, maybe never. Correct. And these guys in six months, we said, okay, now you're professional highlight players. And I think LA will admit they weren't very good. <laughs> Right? They really were. Yeah. Really rough. Well, I saw, which I want to get to later, I saw yeah. Magic City Hustle. Yeah, they, but but now we're we're six years from that, right? And these guys are best in the world. Yeah. I mean, L.A. throws probably as hard as any highlight player in the world throws. Catches pretty much as well as anybody can catch. He's as athletic on the court as anybody is. I'm not saying he's, you know, top 10 highlight player in the world, but equate it to golf, right? And he'd be a PGA golfer, who's making the cut at tournaments that that could, some people could never ever yeah. accomplish that. Right. And these guys have done it in a few years. I don't know when you, at some point along the way, all of a sudden you guys went from kind of being bad to, to being pretty good. I don't know exactly when it was for you, yeah, but I, I don't, I don't know when it was, but I know the second year when they ended up bringing, uh, was it Matt? Yeah. And, um, it's like, they brought in guys that took our, our game to another level. Like coaching wise. Um, or well, play-wise. it's just like, it's just like, you know, iron sharpens iron. You have other people that are going to be really good. If you're, com if you're having a competitive, you know, mindset, you're going to want to figure out how to keep up with that person. And it's, they brought people in to kind of pull us up, um, as well. I was going to ask you a question about that. And actually this is, I've always been very curious about this. How is it that you guys run practice? Like if you're running football practice, you know, you have film, you have this, how is it that you get ready for your next tournament or how is it that you guys run your practice as a team? to build the camaraderie or what's like the day-to-day -day like there for highlight? Um, it varies. A lot of it is in the off season. Um, we practice together and, and sometimes it'll just be getting experience, just playing. And then once we get that experience playing, feeling each other out, um, then we can kind of say like little small tweaks here and there, like, Hey, make sure you come up a little bit more, um, on the ball or, or, Hey, I let the guys know that, you know, I'm always behind you. Um, or if, I feel, if I don't feel confident in a certain thing, I'll be like, hey, you know, can you help me on this side? And then with that dialogue, you're able to figure out how the chemistry works with you and your individual partner. And are you guys like watching film? Like when you're going against an opponent, do you know this, he likes to throw left, he likes to throw right? Or is that, is that, or is this kind of like, like, is it shifting? Is it, there's like a strategy that changes consistently? Yeah, I would say with every, with every um, team that we play against, the strategy would be a little bit different, but there's like some fundamentals that we just try to continue to, continue to do no matter who it is um but they could be little things uh we played a game against Goenaga and arta and i think they're going to be a little bit different than um gochari and ben gotcha um so it's just like yeah it's, it's like little things here and there i'll watch uh i'll watch video um of my competitors in advance to see you know what it is i can work on but a lot of i think a lot of a lot of it is like what can we control? Like feeling wise, yeah. Well, feeling wise, yeah. And then there's other things like you know making sure you get good sleep, nutrition, all that, all those Got things. You. Yeah, so. the typical thing. Yeah. Um. So you're playing against someone. What's the shot? I mean, I've seen it from afar. What's the shot that you're like, fuck? You know, like, is it like the corner hit? Is it like what is it that you're seeing? If someone's like hitting you over and over and over again, that it's like it's actually gonna be where you feel like they have an advantage over you. Yeah. For me personally, if they get on my outside or if their uh, front quarter gets it up close. And they're throwing it really hard, low into the inside. 
That's like my weakness. It's that's like, weakness. yeah. So, so they know that typically. Yeah, yeah no, every, everybody knows that's that. That's a weakness. Yeah, everyone has their own little weakness. And then I think there's certain, like for me going up against other people, it's like, I know that there's certain balls that I can throw. They're going to be tougher for them to get or if I'm catching them off guard because they're going to expect a lot of what I do to be from my right side. Um, so then if I do an outside placement or something, a lot of times they're not going to expect that. Or whether it's a two ball to, to go outside, you know, there's like a lot of different things I can kind of try to mix up um, to do. Or if I put a little bit more spin on the ball as it's coming towards the inside of the wall, that can kind of trip them up a little bit. Gotcha. And uh, Scott, you were telling earlier about the, the idea kind of started at, at Dania Beach. I've been to Dania Beach and the core is much longer than the one you guys have here in the fronton. Uh, tell me a little bit of why that's like that. So we did a lot of things to change the sport. You know, we thought the core sport was amazing and the rules, we haven't changed the rules, but there's no standard size highlight fronton. It's not like a tennis court or a basketball court. So our idea was make the court smaller, which will make the game faster. It's already the fastest ball sport in the world. They're throwing the ball 150 miles an hour. But at Dania, you basically have almost twice as much time from when the ball hits the front wall till it gets back to you as you do at our court at Magic City, which means our guys just, they have to be better athletes. Um, yeah. And we wanted the points to go faster. Now the guys have gotten so good that some of the points – they go on and on, right? Because that's how good they've gotten at the sport. But we did things like two serves instead of one serve, which to us made sense because tennis, you get two serves, right. right? You want the guy really to throw the piss out of the ball on the first serve, which we try and encourage, and guys like L.A. can. And then on the second serve, just want to get it in, which is which is pretty much how they do it in tennis. So usually you just try to get into play. Well, yeah. Well, if we're yes, for the most part, yeah. Most part, trying to get into play. <laughs> yeah. When I, well, yeah. When I'm throwing, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make it as tough as I can for them. But on the first serve, on the first serve, on yeah. First serve, got you. So, like I said, I'm throwing the piss out of it. <laughs> the, the other thing, the doubles, and I never understood this in highlight, and I had never even asked LA this. So it'd be good to get his reaction. They used to just play with a different partner every single game. They never had a set doubles partner in tennis. The tennis. Guys have a set partner, sometimes all season or for years and years. We changed it in the way we play where for at least for one season, like right now LA's on two doubles teams. He has two guys he plays with every match that he plays. To me, that builds the camaraderie, and I think it's better than having a new partner. But I've never even sort of asked you guys that. Yeah, no, I mean, I love it. I think it's a, it gives us opportunity to see like that chemistry to build that chemistry that camaraderie it's um i think it's great and then we can kind of build off of that and to kind of see what works you know, are you but... guys when you're playing those doubles you obviously you have someone who's playing the front mm -hmm. court and then someone's playing the back court yeah are you like constantly when you guys stand by each other are you constantly communicating or are you just it's just you just feel each other how is like the flow on the court yeah i think there's a having like court sense to see where all the other three players are as well as a ball but kind of being aware of how the whoever has the ball how they're throwing it and kind of predicting where it's going to be um but then as far as like the actual communication it's um we're calling it if i can't get to a ball that's going to be in between between us i'm like i'm calling him you know you and then or if it's over my head i'm calling it that hey this i can't get it you know it's you um and now he'll if he can't get something coming into the inside i gotta be make sure that i get it he'll call it for me to get it so there's there is that direct communication and then sometimes it's like you just there might not be enough time to react to actually say something. And so you just kind of have to know where to be sometimes. So, yeah. And, and that comes with the, us being able to work together and build that chemistry over time. Which leads me to my next question. Just to put you on the hot seat right now. You've been playing for seven years now? Yes, yeah, my seventh Who year. Who would you say are your top three players to play with on the same doubles team? Of the with? Um, I, I would say I would say right now, because we were doing the best, we're undefeated. We just have one more game to go. Um, uh, each of day. Um, That's number one. Yeah, I'll say number one. Um, Shout out to Ita Bide. Yeah. Love that guy. He's a champ, too. <laughs> um, yeah, Ita Bide is awesome. Um, I enjoyed playing with Ikeda. Uh, we ended up winning the doubles championship in uh, in Pelota. And um, let me see, third. I'm trying to think about my mother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll stay with two. We'll stay with yeah, two. Yeah, yeah, no, those, those guys have been great. <laughs> All right, now I'll, I'll say the other side of the question. I would also want to throw in uh, CRB because we did get a second place um, okay. one time, so... Um, actually, you know what? Third one, Hiro. I didn't get to finish my season because of injuries last year, but Hiro, Hiro and I, we're on a roll. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, I'll say, who is it that when you see that schedule and you see that lineup, you're like, 
damn, I don't want to play against these guys. <laughs> Give me your th your top three toughest opponents. Um, I would say one of my toughest, uh, Manu. Okay, Manu is just like a monster. He's a monster. Like yeah. he's he's an amazing backcourter, and he doesn't um, look like a, a like a highlight player either. Yeah, you know? he does. You know, so, it's, like, it's surprising. He's, exactly, he's like Jokic from like basketball and stuff. Super smooth. And man, he just he's able to. I think he has amazing uh, court sense. Um, very very consistent catcher thrower. Um, and very precise. And uh, every time I get on the court, I'm like. I know he's going to do the one shot that's going to try to get me. And lo and behold, it's like he does it. I'm like, ah, sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't. But it's just like, I know I just got to keep on working on it. But you have your worst record against him? Um, like one-on-one? -on -one I, or... uh, I don't know about like one-on-one. -on -one. It's probably when it comes to doubles. Um, but um, I would say he's won um, this season, from what I can remember, catching against uh, Goanaga has been the toughest. I had a, played him in two different matches. And uh, the first one that was... Both of them actually was was difficult, but he's a very uh, strong front quarter. Um, and then um, another one. Let's see. Uh, I think I think one of my one of my my peers and rivals. Not that I'm like worried about it, but it's always like a good game because I know he's gonna be like very competitive because we're we're good buddies. Uh, is Ben? It's always yeah, like. Man, we get in there and we just like we just One go at the, it, yeah. So yeah, he has a good so, motor too. Yeah, he does. And 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 Scott, going to you know, obviously, how is it running a league with how many general, how many, how many young, how many professional players do you have right now? Thirty eight right now. Thirty eight players. Tell me a little bit about like you know how is it running a league with thirty eight players right now? Several team team owners and like it's it goes a little bit deeper. You want to explain a little bit about that? Sure. Running the league is great. Um, we're we're really lucky. I mean, I tell people. Whenever we're talking about highlight the sport or the players, as far as a professional sport goes, I don't think you'll find one where the quote unquote owners and players are all on the same page. Like there's no disharmony. There's no like, oh, management doesn't like players or players don't like management. Everybody gets along, which you almost never find in professional sports, mostly because we all know we're underdogs and we're trying to fight our way to get the sport, the exposure it deserves. Um, we're trying to obviously build it so the guys can earn more prize money. Um, and that's been the kind of the motto since the beginning. And they all get it. You know, I mean, all these guys, I mean, LA was a, essentially a world class, you know, track, track star, right? Um, who didn't go on to a career in professional track and field, came to a career in professional highlight, right? And we have a lot of guys like that throughout the whole locker room. You know, they, they excelled at some other sport, and now they're here playing high lie. I sometimes joke joke around, you know, it's like that second chance you. Um, you know, so I think that the, all the players understand that, and they all kind of feel the same way. Even even the Spanish guys who are second and third generation, they know, hey, this sport is is hanging on. We, we all got to band together and take it to the next level. So that part's great. Um, we have owners now. Um, some celebrity owners and some non-celebrity yeah. owners. I was going to ask you about that. How did the league change or did you see anything different once you started bringing on celebrity owners that you've been doing for a handful of years now? Yeah, I mean, bringing on the celebrity owners was great in terms of awareness and branding. Um, you know, you have a Ray Lewis or a Lawrence Taylor or a Jorge Masvidal or a Jeannie Bouchard, and these are people that everybody knows um, going back 10, 20, 30 years or you know, now, I mean, Jeannie's still a, a professional tennis player. So they know them and they bring some cachet to the league. I like the owners who are owning a team because they love the sport, not just the celebrity owners. They get very passionate. Like sometimes I'll have not fights with the owners, but like. It's chippy. Disagree. It's chippy. Yeah, it's and, chippy. And, the, and, and I like that. You know, like, I don't know if they know that I like that, but that means they're passionate about yeah, not, it, right? Especially now when the playoffs are, you know, yeah, the playoff I mean, run starts, you know, it's like, you know, win or go home, you know, type of approach, you know. The other night, we, we actually, so the owners, um, one of the teams were there. It's the team that um, Ray and Lawrence are co-owners of. And there was a forfeit match where they got the forfeit. So they're getting the point. They don't have to play. And they're, literally up in my face like hey we don't want to forfeit someone should substitute we should play this match and i'm like yeah. man you got the point you know like like no 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 but you know that other team should put someone on that court we want to play i'm like i like the that's great that's a great passion idea. The rules, right you know? it's it's i mean well i'm trying to explain the rules but <laughs> but still they're like they don't even want a free point you know and that's going to get them closer to the playoffs 
and they're fighting right now to see who's first or second at the end of the you know at the end of the year, which makes a big yeah. difference. Because um, this year you got four teams going to the playoffs. Four teams going to the Excellent. playoffs. I think LA's team is probably going to finish third as it looks right now. They're in the play. Like there's the Chargers are in. Like there's no doubt about it. Um, Devils will most likely finish fourth, but there's still a little bit of a fight at the top between the Renegades and the Warriors. And you're you're giving a team a free point, and it's like no one play. That's incredible. Which is you know. That's yeah. crazy. Well, that goes to speak to the mindset of the people you have coming on board. You're talking about Lawrence Taylor and Ray Lewis. These are the ultimate competitors, you know, like winning Super Bowl, you know. Yeah. it's. I mean, seeing those guys there, to me, is surreal, right? Um, do you, off the top of your mind, give me 10 athletes or 10 pro athletes that you've seen there that you've been like, these guys have come to watch Highlight in their face. You could just name them. Well, I mean, you've had, you know, Ray and Lawrence and Jeannie Bouchard and Monica Puig um, and Maz Vidal. And then we've had a whole bunch of athletes who have just gone to check it out. Yeah. I mean, El Duque Hernandez has been out two or three times now. He loves highlight. Glenn Rice comes fairly routinely. He loves highlight. The number one, I don't want to take away from all the UD has been, I mean, he came in as a team owner. His team wins the championship the first year. Incredible. He's got an amazing camaraderie with his with his team. People told me they saw him at uh, Anatomy working out with them. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. He's, they have their own chat. They go to lunch. He just had his push-up challenge the other yeah. day, and the whole team went out there. They all competed. I think they did collectively 2,200 push-ups. Ben, who, on the back ben of Ben. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ben did 600 push-ups himself, which was like three times more than I think anybody else did, right? And, I mean, UD's there, like, and he's a, I mean, he just retired, right? So he, he gets it, yeah. right? These guys are competing. Unfortunately, they're not making, you know, the millions of dollars that UD made, but the intensity of the competition is exactly it's, the same. It's crazy. Some, yeah. In some cases, it's more because, you know, NBA players and, you know, NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, hockey, soccer, they're making these huge contracts, right? Quite honestly, you know, they can have an off day or a couple of bad days. It doesn't really mean all that much. These guys really get paid to win, right? I mean, for a couple of seasons in battle court, they could play two matches, lose two matches. They might go three sets and leave that night earning nothing. Wow. You know, we changed it a little now where right. even if your team loses the night and even if you don't win a match, you earn something. But imagine like playing six sets and you're, you know, you're pretty gassed at the end of that and you, you know, gave 110% and you've zero to show for it. Yeah. So, you know, that's... I can definitely say there's there's not a time when we're uh, not out there busting our ass, leaving it all on the court, so... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's either, you know, it's paper for performance, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. You gotta eat. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta hunt. You gotta eat. That's amazing. Yeah. How uh, tired are you guys? I would, so, Benny, who's another player on the Chargers team, he, he played the other day. And Benny's young. He's like, what, 20, 21? Something like that, yeah. In, in very, very good shape. Played a three-set match against Goanaga, who he who we lost to in three sets. And I, and I spoke to him the next day and he goes, man, I was gassed at the end of it. And I'm like, here's a 20 year old kid who's in really good shape. And he was gassed. I mean, like, I don't think people appreciate the, like when you guys come off after three sets, Yeah. I mean, aside I mean, from you're drenched, I mean, yeah. it, 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 it takes, it takes a whole lot. Cause then like the next day it's like different parts of my body. I didn't realize that it's like, it's sore. It's like the bottom of my feet from having to move and wow. all the dynamic movement that we got to do, jumping, decelerating, accelerating, like, the momentum to throw the, the wrist oh yeah everything is like everything through uh-huh. here is like just bulletproof now but i have every single joint <laughs> from here to my fingers has been sore or injured at some point i've either had to take some time off or or uh kind of work through it but um and, and talking about you know that you um you get paid to win mm-hmm. okay what is what has been like your biggest payday do you have like a biggest payday match or biggest payday year anything like that like that you've been like okay i gotta win this match um What's the most that someone could win in a match, in a very meaningful match? Well, in in a tournament, like if you win the world tournament, the, w- the winning team is splitting twenty thousand dollars. Okay, so it, over two days, they can win twenty grand. Gotcha. Um, in in the battle court, essentially in one night, every player on the team could win five grand. Oh wow! In one night, um, but LA's won a couple of doubles championships. Yeah, I won a couple of doubles championships um, with Ikeda. Um, so that was a, that was a decent payday. I don't remember specifically how much, but it was good. That's a few thousand, but that, but they earned that over 
a longer period of time. Yeah, it was over a longer period of time. Yeah, yeah. you're paying an attorney there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know. yeah, yeah. And um, how is it that, like, how can these payouts become higher? Is it just people have to invest more into the league, or how does how does how do you see that happening? Well, a lot of it has a few things. Sports betting will will drive us. You know, now we're on the DraftKings platform, which is a, a big deal for the league. And apparently, we just went on FanDuel on Tuesday. Wow! So we're on the two biggest platforms in the U.S. Getting us on the platforms was a a big step, and we're very proud of that. But now that we're on the platform, we got to get more exposure for the sport and get people to start betting start online on it. Yeah. They have to watch it. I mean, the, the thing with highlight, I think is nobody knows it. Like, I don't know if yeah. LA even knew what highlight was. I had no idea what it was. Yeah. I'm from up North. And I think the most I, experience I had with highlight was on the Dos Equis commercials. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's, right. and, but that's super typical. And, and outside of the East coast, you know, like Florida up the East coast, there's maybe a little bit of knowledge, but you talk people in Chicago or Texas never. or LA or, you know, Denver, or whatever, they, they never heard of it. So we have to have them watch it and then they have to get an understanding of it. You know, the rules are pretty easy. I think once it's explained, it's not really that difficult. Um, but you know, they're used to sports. They know. Yeah. But quick question. Why, why do you think a sport that's been around for a hundred years hasn't penetrated the U S market the way maybe, you know, obviously a basketball or something else has penetrated. Super frustrating. So this is the hundredth anniversary of highlight in the U S but it really only was played on the East coast, right? There were, there were at one time 17 of these frontons or courts in Florida, just in Florida, 17. And then there were in Connecticut, they were in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, right? Um, and and there used to be 10,000 people going in a night to watch Highlight. But this is back in 60s, 70s. And then it started fading out as they went through the 80s. You know, Miami Vice did this whole episode on, on Highlight because yeah. it was a big deal. But it was really an East Coast thing. For a brief time, there was a fronton in Las Vegas in the in, in the MGM Grand, the old MGM. Whoa. So we we got to resurrect, right? And we, we got to get this new generation of people who like action sports and these new sports. And, you know, it'll get me going about how cornhole is a joke. It's bullshit. It's not really a sport. <laughs> you have the, Darts. you have the slapping now, the thing that they oh, went yeah, pillow that. fighting, like, slap what? fighting. I mean, <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, I can't, I can't help the, the thing about highlight. What LA was saying about his body and all, and the throwing and everything. So if in a match, Right, and he sometimes plays two in a night. But in one match, LA might throw because we're we're monitoring that. He might throw two hundred times. Right, that's like a baseball pitcher throwing two hundred pitches. No baseball pitcher after after a hundred pitches. Now you're out. You're automatically out. And then you have four days to recover. He could play on a Monday and then play on a Tuesday, or play on a Tuesday and then play on a Friday. It's insanely taxing, you know, on the body. And I don't think like people understand like. Wow, the, that would be like this baseball pitcher who I think is great. He pitches on Monday, and then he's going to pitch again on Tuesday. There's not a single one in in the whole sport that could do that. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, it's it's you know, football players look they get a week, a week to rest. And now, and now, as you once you get to the NFL, it's kind of more like you're just like a maintenance that like you're kind of like going through like walkthroughs and things like that. You're not really tackling each other, yeah, anymore. You know, especially you're you know those people are worth you know millions and millions of dollar contracts, so they don't want them to get hurt. Yeah. And even though the NFL has put in rules in place to like soften the game a little bit too right. which i think has made it more safer because parents were pulling kids away from pop warner and things like that you know so that was a good move so you you mentioned earlier the um, magic city hustle right uh which is a great great documentary i saw it on amazon prime how in the world did you get billy corbin to do a magic city hustle movie or documentary on highlight or tell me take me a little behind the scenes of how that idea originated and then i want to ask bradley how it was being a part of the filming of that so a friend of mine reached out to Billy and said they're starting this professional highlight league and they're basically using primarily UM athletes. Um, and at that point, you know, there was like a 15 year gap in the youngest athlete to the oldest athlete. They had all, you know, played different sports at UM and some other college or high school athletes locally. And would you consider making a documentary about it? And Billy said, no, I have no interest in doing it. So I barely knew Billy. I knew him. A little bit and i said well let me talk to billy the reason i had the friend do it is because i thought he'd be a better salesman than i would be so i spoke to billy and i said look all i would like you to do is go to north miami highlight 
which was where they were learning how to play. It's like this little training it was facility. A, it, was, it was rough, <laughs> and, <laughs> but we made it happen. <laughs> yeah, and and so and then I never heard from Billy for like ten days, and then I get a phone call from him, and he goes, "I'm making the documentary." I'm like, "Whoa, what happened?" He goes, "I went to North Miami. I met those guys." He's like, "Holy shit!" Like I'm making this documentary. He goes, "But there's one condition." What? Whatever you want. He goes, "I call it a verite, truth." He goes, "Whatever happens, happens." He goes, if somebody gets killed, somebody gets killed. If somebody okay. gets arrested, somebody gets arrested. <laughs> if, you know, they all walk out halfway through and it never makes it, you know, he goes, this will be a documentary. And I'm like, no, that's fine. These guys are very, you know, committed. And, I mean, the doc is great. The doc is phenomenal. <laughs> it makes you cry. It makes you happy. Like, it, it stirs your emotions. It's yeah. Nice. It really follows the guys, like, the, the story of... Um... You know, the guys who are based out of here in Miami, um, I was more so, you know, from up north, so I didn't get as much exposure in it, but they followed a lot of us throughout the season. You know, some people, like I said, more made it, but um, no, it was it was great. I, I loved seeing the whole thing and how it all, was all put together. It's like they were uh, trying to make sure they get every little bit of, like, grit that they could out of it. And <laughs> and how did the boys, you know, you had the team that's being filmed out, you know, you guys are going, you know, trying to make it into a professional, into a, a sport that you've never played for before in your life. How did the other guys take it? Did they like it? Was it was it enjoyable to them, or did they feel like it was a distraction? Uh, no, I think you know what's funny was like there was times when, when there were like you know there were a lot of emotions in that first year going on, uh, emotions and frustrations, and then like they had to be reminded like, hey, wait, don't forget there's there's cameras around. There's cameras around. <laughs> so <laughs> like a hard knocks type <laughs> approach, you know? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was like be you, but like just be mindful. <laughs> but I mean, it was it was cool. We had we had a great. Time. Who would you say right now in the league is like the the who would you say would is like the one player that you say, man, I I I wanna I wanna have that guy on my team, you know, I, I never wanna kinda go against him, you know. Like it's one of those guys that you want on your squad, uh has like the best camaraderie or just you know, like the be, the one of the better leaders that you have in the in the league. Um give me leaders. a top three if you so like. So I would I would say when I was on the Cyclones, um the the input that Manu gave, I think, was great. Um, as far as, like, you know, another person playing with Iturbide has been great playing with him. Um, but what's funny is he, we don't even speak the same language. Like, he speaks very little English. I speak very little Spanish. But somehow, like, we figure this shit out. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful about sports, though. So yeah. Sports bring it's everyone like, together. It doesn't matter where you're from, language, you yeah. are, you know? Exactly. It's amazing. It's a, it's, it's, it's a game changer. Um, I had a couple questions here, uh, Scott. Where right now, if I want to bet on highlight, where do I go to bet on highlight? Well, if you live in Florida, you can't. Unfortunately, <laughs> okay. that's a whole other story of essentially us thinking that the Seminoles should not have a monopoly on sports wagering, which would be another another podcast. So right now, you can't bet on us if you live in Florida. Now, if you live in New York, New Jersey, um you know, Colorado, Arizona, there's 20 states, which if you live in, you can bet on us right now on DraftKings or as of yesterday on FanDuel. So I, I joke and it's it's unfortunate because if there was legal betting on Highlight in Florida, the money would be pouring in. And I think we would see, um, you know, higher prizes and more profitability, the league working its way toward profitability. I hope that we'll get that accomplished in the next couple of years. Um, but at least we're in 20 states and people are starting to to really recognize us and bet on us. And we've got DraftKings and we've got FanDuel. So major steps forward. And then we have to work on the international market. That's the thing. The sport is really not an American sport. It's it's it's, it's international sport, sport, right? I mean, Spain, France, Mexico, the Philippines, other portions of Asia, they they know highlight, right? And and it's been played there. In some places it's still played, in other places it's not played, but they know, you know, people know the sport. So getting it international exposure really important um but look you're here but you must have a buddy in new york or illinois or you know new jersey you just call them up pennsylvania they open an account at DraftKings. They can you, bet. you tell them who to bet on or right? you get a vpn man you know you know the players pretty well <laughs> yeah i was gonna ask you um so obviously on, on tick you guys have a TikTok for the world highly league that has had monster uh videos go viral you know 50 plus million views you guys have a nice Instagram, but more than anything, you guys have done a phenomenal job at um, bringing highlight open to the public every Friday, and you partake the season into two. Well, you partake the year has two seasons. Tell me a little bit about how Friday nights are at highlight and how that has evolved. 
Friday nights at the Fronton, I mean, we, we think it's, it's continuing to evolve more and more people coming out. Um, you know, it's sort of like, um, a pre-party is what I've been told. See when right. it ends at 10 or 10 30, I'm going home. But when it ends at 10 or 10 30, you guys and young people are going out. So you show up at seven o'clock, right? It's free parking. It's free admission. The drinks are half or a third of a drink at South beach or, yep. you know, brickle or whatever, <laughs> you know? So you, it's, it's that whole idea of come on out, you know, have fun. Uh, we actually have a wagering game now that people can play for free. So you can win money and it costs you nothing. So it's kind of a great experience because yeah. you can learn the game. You can maybe win some money. You can have some drinks. You know, you don't have to worry again, parking and mission free. And, and you got to see a great sport and, and you got to see history of Miami. Yeah. Right? It's a hundred years here. That's, that's a long time. I mean, hundred years of high lie in Miami is longer than a lot of professional sports have even been around, period. Yeah, well, I mean, I've gone on Fridays. Uh, it's great. Yeah, it's a very nice family-oriented atmosphere. Uh, you get to see the players live. You get to feel the action right there. It's uh, You got the DJ. You got dancers. You got, you know, you got some nice entertainment as well. Yeah, I would say when I, my son, he loves coming on Friday nights. It's like one of his favorite things to do. He, like, looks forward to it when he's, you know, with dad. Yeah, and we're I, going to the going I to get calls now. <laughs> Are you a highlight friend? I'm like, yes, I am. You know, <laughs> it's like I have 20 people. I have 15 people. But it, it's it's honestly, it's a very nice, fun time, you know, and you're watching, obviously, a great sport. And you guys now that's from our side. We go, we hang out, we go home, we chill, we go out. How is it you guys, I know you guys play during the week, but how much does a Friday night game mean for you guys? How do you prepare for that? Uh, does it feel any different than the weekly games that you have people, you have a crowd there? I know that it's usually a little bit, people usually, usually you know, mm -hmm. get a little bit more, you know, scared under the lights. <laughs> no, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm uh, scared under the lights. Um, it's it's kind of like every other game I come out to win, uh, try to be focused and, you know, make it happen. And, uh, but it's really great to know that there's other people out there, you know, rooting for us, cheering for us, especially if they're in our crew. Do you hear the people cheering, or are you, like, just tunnel vision focused? You know, I've always been, like, from the time playing track, basketball, football, whatever, it's always been, like, very tunnel vision focused. Like, I remember, like, when I run track, I'd be at, like, the state championship or whatever, and my mom is, like, screaming in the stands. And she, like, she <laughs> af after after I won, she'd be like, did you hear me at all? And I'm like, Mom, I couldn't hear anything. So it's just, like, I'm I'm pretty, like, tunnel vision and yeah. focused to make it happen. I mean, so. you, some, you hear some now more aggressive, you know, I don't want to say derogatory things, but towards yeah. the refs, yeah, you know, sometimes yeah, it's a miss yeah. a call, you know. The, I mean, the players, I think, are in general, maybe not even when you're on the court, but maybe when they're watching the other matches, everybody seems more pumped up on Friday nights. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. And, and you know, I like when the, the guys are looking like who's out in the audience, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, any celebrities, any hot girl, you know, yeah, it's yeah. like they're, they're looking, yeah, you know, they're, yeah, let's face we want to show looking. out, you know, you want to show out. <laughs> yeah. Now you're going to get it. Every day. It's not yeah. Good. Yeah. So now, especially when you got family out there, you know, oh, yeah. I, I mean, I played sports not to your level. I played high school sports. Yeah. And when your family's in the stands or your friends, you want to show out, you know? Yeah. And, and if you don't, you kind of, you know, you take it hard on yourself. You know, yeah. it's funny. Some people who come to highlight, they don't even know, like they're allowed to yell and scream. You know, we have to tell, Hey, yell, scream, cheer. Like yeah. this isn't like, you know, a sport like golf, like golf. you're supposed to be quiet. You're supposed to be loud. Yeah. Um, some of the guys definitely feed off it. Like you see some of the guys more to the crowd. Ikeda definitely, you know, he he's plays to the crowd. A lot of them do. But now um, our guys, I'm going to say our guys, the originals, because they're very much like the most important to me. And yeah. I think, I think they know that some of the other players may not like that so much, but if it weren't for the original guys, we wouldn't, yeah. be, we wouldn't be here. Right. And we were telling them now they all come, from sports backgrounds other than highlight. So it's like, hey, when you win, you know, show it. Which which our guys were good about. The Basque players were taught growing up, whether you win or you lose, no emotion. So we've had to work. Oh, yeah. I think why in the that? back. That's curious. Yeah, I, been, I feel like being in the back, we hear uh, Stu talk about, um, you know, we're just supposed to come play the game and just shut up and be quiet. So it's like, cool. yeah, cool. like Stu doesn't want us to say anything. Mm -hmm. And then there's like so much like banter and bickering going on, <laughs> like on, yep. on the uh, when we're in the back in the cage. And, you know, personally, I, I love it. And I'm, I'm like used to it, essentially. So it's just like, you know, is, is there any like going. smack talk back there going on between teams? Um, I wouldn't say there's like necessary. Oh, well, with me, I'm like kind of in my head and kind of quiet in general. So, because like, it's like such a competitive environment for me, so I don't say a whole lot. But um, yeah, I, I feel like there, there's definitely some going on. How about on the court? Like if you if someone's up, you know. Oh, if somebody uh, pisses me off and like they did some type of dirty something, like I'm gonna say something. Like there's been moments where I'm in mean, like, hey, like back the fuck up. Have like, you guys ever had a fight? 
break out on the court? Or? We've not, not had on the court. There's been like yeah, there's some not, stupid dude. stuff in, in the in the back. There was yeah. like I've had a couple of run-ins the first year, like with uh you know one of our former players, and then there was one who got booted off for taking a little bit too far. But uh you know a couple people have gotten in each other's faces. Yeah, that's the thing though with sports. Like it's not a problem, you know, it's getting chippy and getting heated at each other because I think it brings out the best, uh, especially when you're so competitive. But there is a line that you don't want to cross, you know, between like you know respecting your peers and you know they're respecting the game. Well, and we everybody shares a locker room, mm -hmm. so like it's not like football at halftime yeah. where they go yeah. different. <laughs> like these guys are all sharing a hey, locker room, <laughs> so it's more like you know golf or tennis. Where look, I'm sure tennis players get into it with each other. Mm -hmm. After sometimes even on court, but for sure, yeah. at, you know, because they are sharing locker rooms at those tournaments, not like they have separate. But these guys are, you know, day in day out, and sometimes they're switching teams from season to season, right. which is which I always like. I don't really want to know too much, but I know there are guys back there. Look, I don't think there's anybody back there like hate somebody else, but there are definitely guys who don't, don't like yeah. certain guys <laughs> as much. I mean, look, we have a we have a guy who's not playing this season who was playing last season and, and you know he pissed off a lot of people so um you got to be sensitive to that all right so now uh, i got one question for you and a last one for scott right <laughs> all right he, he brought me back to something he just brought it in my mind right now and you're switching teams you know sometimes people are switching teams every season mm -hmm. how is it that you feel on draft night are you kind of like hoping you go to a team or give me walk me through a little bit of your feeling are you are you evaluating everybody are you seeing how the teams are being prepared and like i hope i don't go to that one um i think it's it's always in in my head it's just like i don't want to be one of the uh the guys picked last which I, I can't say i've been picked last but um it's uh it always feels better to be like wanted and then you know picked earlier on um you know, you hear about some of the strategy, like afterwards, I've talked with some guys on the other teams and they, you know, we talked about the strategy, what they were thinking about on draft day. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, no, I see that. I get that. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, no, it's just like, sometimes it's like, you wish you were picked before this other person. Like that happens. You That's know? a good point because I, uh, you know, my, I myself have been part of those draft nights and, and those strategies are way different than they usually are for right. any other sport, you know, because you're counting on other people to make certain moves. Not and necessarily when you're when you're playing football, it's kind of like best you know best mm -hmm. player at that position that you that you need right. and that we're next you know. Yeah. But here it's like you got a back court, you got a front court, you got doubles, you got to play, you yeah. got certain matches, you got a competitor. Exactly. So there's a lot of strategy that I, goes I just, into it. Yeah, going with what Les is saying. To me, look, I'm not a player. Draft day is the most stressful day of the year. Or two, we have two drafts a year. Mm -hmm. Those two days, they're my most favorite and my least favorite. Um, I'm not there getting chosen. But as I see things go, because look, the league wants the best thing for the league, all the teams to be equal, Correct. right? We don't, we don't like when one team is great and one team is terrible. It's not good for the league. So I'm sitting there watching and it's not like the league is drafting. The owners are drafting and I'll be like, fuck, <laughs> you know, like, why did they, why did they, why did they go that route? Yeah. Why'd they pick that player? I mean, this, this year's draft, uh, I've spoken the past season the the Warriors had the first pick in the draft. They took Douglas. No one was expecting that to happen. And that basically changed the whole draft as soon as that happened. You know, it, like everyone had their who they thought they were going to get and who they wanted to take. And then it was like changing, changing, changing. And uh, and like L.A. saying, I always feel bad for the guys who don't get picked. You know, because there's usually one or two but players. But they go to like in a reserve mode. They, no? they're, on the, they're on the taxi squad and and – Pretty much anyone who's ever been on the taxi squad has played during the season. Some have played a lot when there's been injuries. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's draft night, right? And in the NFL draft, if you don't get picked, you're you're home. <laughs> you're yeah. not sitting there and you're like the guy left over. So that's, you know, that's a bad thing. I mean, guys, you know, they understand. and But that's got to be hard. You know, I mean, think about it's like the last kid getting picked when you're playing. Yeah, when yeah, you're a yeah. kid playing. I've been there. <laughs> basketball or football, right? You know, yeah. it's it, it is like that. But then, but but you know what? That, that sparks a fire inside of you too. You know, like mm -hmm. to get better. You know. Yeah, yeah. we have guys who yeah. haven't gotten well. El Barba yeah. went for a couple seasons. Yeah. He didn't get drafted. Right? He got drafted not even as the last pick this year. He was picked, you know, by the Chargers. Right? Mm -hmm. He was so fired up, and and I think he 
plays with a chip on his shoulder he because does. of that. He does. Without a doubt. Yeah. And he plays aggressive. I, I mean, he's been, I mean, from what I saw last year to this year, he's, I mean, yeah, when, when he, good. yeah, okay. he's playing he's really playing well. well. Yeah, he's yeah when, well. He, when he's he started well. the season, he was just like on fire. And yeah. then, you know, you got to keep that fire going. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So now, uh, talking earlier, you got four teams in the playoffs this season, right? What is your playoff prediction? <laughs> I'm not supposed to to do that. I, I mean, I would say this. I theoretically I, speaking, yes. Theoretically how do you think speaking, the playoffs will play out? Well, I mean, I think that. Let's say is this going to post before, or before, <laughs> or after? Yeah, <laughs> Go this ahead. is going to be all right. So, look, the it, it looks like right now that the playoff matchups will be the Renegades should based on where they are right now, they have a game in hand or whatever over the over the Warriors, that they would win with the Devils coming in fourth. And then the Warriors and the Chargers would finish second, third. So that means in the first round, the Renegades are going to play the Devils. The Renegades are going to be a huge favorite, right? My thing is Oleron, who's playing his first year here from Spain, he was the number one front court player in France and Spain. He He's been not a hundred percent the whole season. Like he played yesterday at way less than a hundred percent. He was banged up. If, if he's a hundred percent in the playoffs, the devils will give the renegades like a run for their money. It will be very, very close. Even though like the odds makers will say, Oh, renegades are going to crush him gotcha. in the playoffs. I see that as the devils actually could pull the upset though. The warriors chargers, that's like a toss up. Because they're they're very equal, gotcha. right? And then, so anything could really happen. I mean, everyone just I won't say assumes, but everyone's looking at oh, with the Reneg the um, Renegades with Gosheri, right? Because they have Gosheri and Arats play one doubles, and then Gosheri and Ben. And I don't, I I think Gosheri and Ben. I don't know if they've lost. Uh, one, they have one or two, yeah. and and even Arats and Gosheri. yeah. I think we actually beat them one time. Just yeah. To, oh, wait, wait, no, no. For the record, I don't know. I think they're in second. I think they're in the the, the second tier. So we have. I don't think we played them. But so you know, like people are kind of. <laughs> I don't want to say assuming, but they're thinking, oh, the Renegades will repeat as champions. But I would say in the first round of the playoffs, you know, Devils, awesome. the returning champions could get beat by the Devils in the first round. It wouldn't be shocking to me, mostly because somehow the Devils, I really don't know when you look at them on paper, they don't look like a strong team, like man by man. But then when they go out and they play their matches, I mean, um, their two doubles team is Jairo and Urbieta. They haven't lost, right? They're, I'm, uh, I don't know. For they're either sure, seven right? and one or eight. No, they're like impossible to beat. Um, but Oleron, as a one, you know, he plays doubles one, and then he plays with CRB at. A, I don't know. If, I don't know if they play against you guys. I'm not sure what number they play at. Off the top of my head, we've it's been a little while since we played them, so I don't remember. For sure. Don't don't. I would just say don't count them out in the first round of the playoffs. It'd gotcha. be like the wild card team winning the world series. It happens. It has happened. It's yeah. happened recently. Happened so it can happen. Well, no, we had, we were in the plan for the Miami heat last season. Yeah. Yeah. yeah look, you made it. Right. Yeah. Championship. So, yeah, so it does happen. If you got that dog in you, you know, you can get it. Yeah. Um, talking about all around, um, you, you touched on something that was interesting. You just had an expansion team, which was the fireballs this last season. Yeah. Uh, how is it that you source players and bring them to the city and bring them to Miami? And, and how are you sourcing the best players in the world? It's getting harder and harder. Um, with the Fireballs, uh, four of the guys, well, three of the four guys, were ex-Dania players. So they were here, right? They, were, they, ha they hadn't played in a couple of years professionally, but they were very good players at Dania, and they wanted to come join the league. So it was, it was pretty easy. Um, Another player, Cabrera, he played at Calder for a couple of years, and he was, you know, reaching out to us. Can I come play? Can I come play? Um, Hernandez, Duke, uh, had been a professional player for years and years. He got hurt. He hadn't played in a few years, and he told us he was going to be in Miami for, like, these four months. So it wasn't that difficult to get enough players to have that sixth team. Now, we did bring Oleron from France and Lopez from Spain, the interesting thing about Lopez is this guy for 20, he's 40. Yeah. For 20 years, undisputably the best backcourt player in the world. Wow. Manu would probably be number two in the world. He is having a really rough season at Magic City. Wow. It's, it's a shorter court. It's a different game. You can't just walk out there and be like, I'm the best. And he's, a, he's like a humble guy, hardworking guy. But I think he thought he would be doing better than he's doing. And, and he told me the other day, he goes... On this court, you have to earn every point. 
I mean, you really do. The guys, yeah. the guys that there's no like the on the big court, right? You could throw a high bounce, and it's going to bounce over the guy, and boom, that's it. Yeah, you can't do that on this court. There, there's no, yeah. there's no oh, easy points. To, yeah, yeah. You you yeah, earn was, every point. It was funny. Um, we my first game against Lopez, I was um asking. I think it was uh, Ubia. I was like, hey, what's, what's the background on this guy? And he was just like, maybe I, I don't think I should tell you before <laughs> your first game with this guy. Getting nervous. I was, uh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, what uh, what Scott was saying, was like, yeah, one of the best in the world. Um, I, I think we were lucky to pull off the, uh, to pull it off. But like watching how he played, like when I reviewed the video, it, it is much more like the style of on the bigger courts and on the shorter court, it, it is much different. There's a lot, a lot to get used to. So, Carter, well, I'm looking forward to the playoffs now. Um, we'll get we'll get the winning team uh, back here into the studio to get a little. Yeah, uh, you'll get the Chargers back. Experience. In here. Yeah, we'll get Chargers back <laughs> in here. Go Chargers, baby! And thank you guys for coming. It's real been, been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Eddie. Appreciate oh, it, yes, sir. All right, LA. All right, yeah, always thank a you. pleasure.